or of KSG or from a sorry I had to hit the that it's being recorded button and has provided for support for many years for the conference. We're grateful for their willingness to engage in a virtual conference and hope to see them in person at the 2021 conference. I encourage attendees to go to the conference website and check out their company profile and resource board information. Danny will be talking about governments and management of COVID-19 related funding. I wanna welcome Danny Martinez, Managing Director BKD, and now I'll just provide a little bit of information about Danny. Danny is a member of BKD National Public Sector Group and oversees audit engagements of governmental entities, including single audits in accordance with uniform guidance. He has more than 13 years of experience providing audit advisory and training services to a client base that includes municipalities and their component units, counties, utilities, school districts, state agencies, tribal governments, and other entities receiving federal assistance. He is the graduate of USC with a bachelor's of science degree in accounting. And I wanna thank Danny and I wanna thank BKD for their continued support of KSGFA. We really appreciate everything they're doing to help KSGFA and to provide exceptional information to its members. And now I'd like to turn it over to Danny. Thank you, Danny. Great, great. Thank you, Ted, uh, for the introduction. And uh, you know, thank you to the Kansas uh, GFOA uh, for having me and for having BKD uh, this morning as your speaker. Um, so as Ted said, I, you know, I kind of do two things with BKD. Uh, you know, I spend half of the time uh, providing, you know, technical accounting assistance, you know, back in that world that we all lived in uh, six months ago, you know, pre-COVID, uh, GASB 87, you know, the LISA standard was really the, the big deal, the big thing that, that we were working on and that I was, you know, helping clients to, to get implemented. Well, obviously, you know, COVID hits, we get a delay on the standard and then the cares act comes out you know it comes out it comes out in april and um you know from then you know we've kind of transitioned to you know, the other role that i play in the firm which is a lot of uh, federal compliance uh consulting single audit type of um of information so that's what we'll be talking about today you know we'll be touching on the uh, management of covid 19 related funding so the agenda that I was asked to, you know, to, to go over, these are the topics that I was asked to go over uh, today. We're gonna to talk about uh, simplifying the complexities of grants management, you know, um, administering federal funds in, in a normal world, um, you know, can be challenging, but administering federal funds under the environment that we're in now, you know, it can, it's just is beyond. So we'll touch on that a little bit. Um, we'll give you some best practices uh, for compliance, like what, where can I be looking? What can I be thinking about as far as what I need to have in order for uh, compliance with the funds? Uh, I was also asked to touch on accounting issues related to the CARES, uh, CARES Act funding. Um, so, you know, as you're going through and you're working through the accounting, when am I recognizing the revenue and expense? Is it operating or non-operating? Uh, you know, those types of questions, the GASB put out some uh, a technical bulletin uh, to help with that. And so I'll point you to that and I'll also share, share some additional resources to uh, stay on top of the latest regulations. The, the interesting thing about this and what I tell, you know, others at the firm, uh, you know, if they're, as they're starting to, to do this work, as, as we get more of the, this consulting type of work is no one knows more than six months worth uh, of what this, these rules are, right? I mean, we all got the same uh, guidance um, in April. We all are seeing the same updates to it. We see the same FAQ questions. Uh, and so really, you know, the resources that are out there are gonna get you a lot of the way there to what, um, what we know and as far as this, you know, this fluid, these fluid regulations. So we'll, we'll touch on that. And then um, lastly, I'll open it up to some, some questions. Uh, I will let you all know that I do have the, the chat box open here on, uh, on one of my screens and I'll be monitoring it you know, throughout the presentation. So don't feel like you have to wait to the end. If there's a question that you have that you know, pertains to the thing that I'm, that I'm presenting on, um, you know, let me know and, I, and I'd be happy to, I'll try to, to uh, address them as we go along. In addition, uh, you will be provided with a, a, a PDF version of this presentation uh, so, so don't worry about taking notes about things that are exactly on the slides, but uh, it will, we'll get that to you all uh, shortly after um, this conference. 
All right. So with that being said, let's go ahead and get started. And, you know, I'm not going to promise the world as far as making this thing completely easy for you, right? I mean, you're, this is as complex as it's going to get in relation to grants management. You know, so in a, in a normal environment, you know, your normal federal funding uh, that you all receive or, or state funding, any type of grant funding, there's always uh, strings attached, right? You're not, you're not usually given this money um, free and clear, right? There's always some types of grant requirements related to, to this funding. So, you know, am I spending it on the right thing? Am I reporting these quarterly reports that they requested? Uh, you know, but luckily with this, if you're getting this grant funding and you're getting it year after year after year and you're getting that experience and that knowledge uh, within your organization as far as, oh, okay, that's what they want to see in this report. Or yeah, that is allowable, that's not allowable because we spent something on that five years ago when we went through this process. Uh, the single audit is another one. Uh, you know, having to um, receive a, an audit if you expend more than 750,000 in federal awards. Usually, you know, if, you've, if you're experienced with um, receiving federal funding and going through a single audit, you, know, you, you have an idea of what the auditors are going to select. You know, maybe it changes a little bit um, from year to year based off of, hey, oh, now I have this bigger construction project. Uh, so that's probably going to be tested because we spent a lot of federal money there. But you kind of have a, a feel for what that single audit is going to be. And then you also have, you know, federal agency review. So you've had this grant for a while and they're, you know, they're going to you and, and you know, you have your person that's assigned to you from the federal agency and they check on things every now and then. And, uh, you know, you kind of, you, you, even though federal agency reviews are never fun, you know, you, you, there's a beat to them, right? But now in a uh, COVID environment, grants are beyond complex. And so, you know, you have grant requirements, but they're changing, you know, they're changing weekly. Uh, you know, if we touch, if, for those of you all that are familiar with the treasury uh, guidance, um, you know, the last, I think the last update was September 2nd related to that, providing some clarification on what you can do with public health and public safety costs and what documentation you do or do not need. Uh, the FAQs were also updated uh, September 2nd. Then if you're getting that money through a state, uh, you know, or through, you're, you're not a direct recipient from treasury, but you're getting it through the state, the state can change their mind as far as, um, you know, what they, what their interpretation of that treasury guidance is. So there's, so you, Dealing with the constant fluidity of, a guide, of the guidance is definitely a, an added challenge. Uh, your single audit without known compliance requirements. You know, we, you, for those of you that are familiar with the single audit, there's this compliance supplement that comes out and it tells us auditors, okay, here are the six or seven things that are subject to audit. Well, we don't have that for the, uh, for the CARES Act funding or for the coronavirus relief funding. That will be out uh, the end of October is what we're being told. I have an idea of what may be in there, so I'm going to share that with you all to make sure that you all are prepared for for what we have, what we think is going to be in there. Uh, but as of right now, your auditor uh, and and you know even the federal government has not publicly released what the those requirements that are subject to audit are. Um, the federal agency review that should say with highly uh, scrutinized funds, right? The you see in the newspaper uh, all the time, uh, you know. This, this city is slow to get funds out. What the heck's going on? What are they doing there? Um, or, oh, you know, our businesses are failing. They didn't utilize it in the pr appropriate way. So, that, so there's a lot of uh, high scrutinization on it. And, and the OIG has even said, you know, hey, we reserve the right to come in anytime in the next five years to, to look at how you all utilize the funding. You have very limited time to utilize the funds, right? You have up until December 30th uh, from Treasury as of right now. And if you are receiving the money from, uh, say, from a state or a county that received the money directly, they can impose a stricter timeline on you. Yeah, we need you to spend it by November because we are gonna, uh, we need that month to make sure that it's util that if you didn't utilize it, that we can repurpose it uh, for something else. So that limited timeline of the funds. There's that pub there where we're talking about the governance and public pressure uh, to get the funds out. You know, hey, we need to get this out. We got to go. We have needs in the community. Um, and then on top of all of that, because of the 
of the um, stay at home orders or, or public health measures that are in, in uh, you know, some counties and states, you have, you have staffing challenges. You're working in a new remote environment. I can tell you all that as we, um, as we perform these, this year's audits at, at BKD, we're gonna be asking about your internal controls like we normally do. And then we're gonna say, okay, well, wh what happened whenever you went remote? What are you doing? Uh, how are you approving that thing that you used to approve manually? And hopefully that you still have the same amount of, uh, you know, segregation of duties um, and those types of things built in there. So where you didn't just say, well, because of COVID remote environment, we're gonna let the same person process the whole entire thing. So I guess to start off really just saying, you know, we sympathize with you all and we understand that this isn't easy. And so uh, I'm again, appreciative of the, the Kansas GFOA for having uh, BKD here this morning to kind of sh share a little bit as far as things that you can do, resources that are out there to, as you're thinking about, um, you know, working, working through this. And I, and I know when you see this, you know, some of you all, the, luckily not all of you guys are on video, but when you see, oh, internal control is great. That's what you're gonna tell me and you need. But really, you know, when you're getting new uh, grant funding, Maybe you have not experienced uh, receiving this uh, funding before. Maybe this is the largest amount that you've ever received before, or you're having to do more things with it, like pass it through to another entity. You really need to make sure that you have that base and that con control structure around it to make sure that you're, um, you're ensuring that you're gonna comply, right? Because the goal, our goal uh, at the end of the day with this funding is let's get it out, Let's utilize it uh, effectively and efficiently, and let's not make it on the headline of, of any newspaper for something that we did um, inappropriately, right? So the best way to do this is, is to utilize internal control. And so I'm gonna touch on two things here. You know, obviously controls presentations can be of any length, but really my two favorite things, well, my favorite thing that I'm gonna show you all today is the compliance supplement uh, part six. So this document, uh, it was updated in, in 2019. So previously in the compliance supplement, it talked about internal controls and they, they just said, you know, they, they, they talked through the, the parameters and it was about a seven page uh, section. Uh, now it's been updated and it's about 31 pages. And it's a really helpful resource that I wanna make sure you all are aware of uh, when you're thinking about what controls do we need to put in within our organization. So they base it on uh, the Green Book and the COSO framework. So it's, it's really structured in, in very, um, you know, in the, in the top of the top as far as uh, frameworks related to controls. And they have two different sections. They have the entity-wide controls and then they have specific controls. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you all a few slides related to, uh, to what, what is in there and what you can pull out. So first it starts off with the entity-wide controls. And so it breaks it out between, you know, control environment, risk assessment, control activities, information communication, and, and monitoring. And it touches on things that you need to make sure that you all have. So for risk assessment, it gives you the principle, you know, make sure that you define uh, the objectives clearly to identify all the risks and risk tolerances. Uh, risk to tolerance is an interesting one, especially as you all are having to pass through money. You know, you, you need to be doing that evaluation of risk of how comfortable do we be? Do we feel passing money through to other organizations, and what type of monitoring do we need to put in place? Um, the the next one, you're making sure that you're responding to those risks. So they so they go through on the entity wide for control the control environment. You know the tone of the tone at the top. They talk about having a code of conduct, having conflict of interest statements. That's probably a little bit more heightened now, right? You're if you're giving out this money, you want to make sure that it's fair and equitable. Um, and that you know we you know at BKD we work with those people that are passing it out to build that application process that that ensures that. Uh, there's some more information there about ensuring a segregation of duties, policies, and procedures. You know, as you're working through this remote environment, you want to double check for that. Information and communication. How are you communicating within your organization? So it touches on entity wide, which is nice. Um, you know, monitoring what you need to be doing, how you need to. Uh, Make sure that you have this these effective self review procedures. But really, where it gets, uh, where I think it provides its most value is here in these control activities. 
So it takes these pr principles related to control activities and it shows you all, here are specific controls that we think that you could implement for your organization for these types of compliance requirements. So you're, if you're thinking about how can I, what can I build in or what do I need to just double check that I have to ensure that I have, um, that, I'm, that I'm spending the money on activities allowed or an allowable cost. So here on the left-hand side, it gives you ideas of uh, what you can do. If you look down at the bottom left, it says supervisors review and approve invoices, cost allocations, effort of pay, uh, personnel. So, you, so that's one idea of what you can do. Uh, making sure your management reviews applicable uh, award, award agreements and contracts for specific allowable activities. So as you're building in, if you're trying to build in a control framework, you, know, you can just kind of pick and choose and pull from this appendix different controls that you think would work best for your organization how do i ensure that i am complying with cash management you know you can look in that that column and they provide you ideas for cash management eligibility how do i make sure that the money i'm giving uh giving to is uh for people that are eligible you know this is the these are controls that you can put in place equipment if you're equipment and real property management and so on and so forth so the 20 the compliance supplement has um you know 13 different, uh, sorry, 12 different uh, compliance requirements that could be subject to audit. And so for each one of them, it breaks down different ideas that you can use for the controls. Then it talk, talks about your information system. Okay, what can I do with these uh, controls, but automate it? You know, a lot of times we maybe miss how good automated controls are, right? If you're locked out and you can't do a certain thing, it helps to prevent, uh, it would help to uh, prevent error because you, you can't even do it if you tried. So for allowable activities, it talks about, hey, set a budget and prevent any expenditure being able to char be charged to that code within your system on, if it exceeds uh, the budget. You know, setting certain parameters around expense categories that, that flag things up uh, within, within eligibility, building up maximums or minimums. You know, if, if someone it's a, a maximum over a certain dollar amount, oh, they're not eligible or, or under a certain dollar amount, they, they are eligible, those types of things. And so it gives you ideas uh, as far as how you can utilize your accounting system to establish controls. And then lastly, policy, the, the last one is policies and procedures. Uh, the highlight you can really ignore is just um, that was updated from the, the draft version to the final version. It's not a, any type of emphasis from me. But if you're going through your policies, you know you have your grants manager, uh, you have you know, your compliance officer, and they're checking their your policies as you're trying to get this money out the door quickly. You check to make sure that you have a structure in place that is hitting some of these beats that it discloses here. So I would recommend if you all are new to grant funding, um, hadn't really thought about uh, the controls, uh, and you want and you and you want to manage that risk a little bit, go through at least principles 10, 11, and 12, and, and see if you feel good that, yeah, we do have at least a, a, a mixed bag uh, to fill in the bucket as far as, um, you know, your my control activity uh, controls. So the way that you find this, uh, you know, I you would search, you know, 2020 compliance supplement part six in, in Google, it should come up pretty easily. Um, and that is a you know a free resource that's out there for you all to develop the controls. So to kind of conclude on this um, this area as far as simplifying grants management, you have some control challenges and tips. It, resource constraints, you know, you can only do so much uh, with, given the time frame that you all have now. You know, the, as currently written, the coronavirus relief funding portion of the funds, you have three months. You know, you know, we're here in October 1st, so you have three months to utilize that funding. If you're a direct recipient, even less if, um, you know, if you're not a direct recipient, you have reporting that's having to be done every so often. Uh, and if you have different types of funding like provider relief funding, you know, they each have different deadlines, different uh, allowability, so we get it. So it really is uh, necessary to understand that it's, that it's an all hands on deck approach in you know, talking to people that have been doing, uh, working with local governments, you know, at our city clients and at our county clients, they, they say that this has been one of the more, most challenging six months, um, you know, since they've been in, 
you know, governmental accounting. So, I mean, definitely you know, sympathize with you all. As far as a, a grant funding uh, area, this, the, the only thing that I can liken it to is 2008 with the ARA funding. And even that, that was less than a trillion dollars. That was mostly capital projects based, which is usually easier to manage from a compliance side. So this is the most challenging uh, you know, federal grant compliance that I've seen in my what, 15, 14 years of doing this. Um, also, you know, recommend consider outsourcing to professional service firms. There's um, some disaster recovery firms out there. There's some professional services firms out there. I'm sure you all are aware that BKD does some uh, of this type of work, but you know, most of the, the costs, um, both with bringing people in to respond to the public health emergency that are usually dedicated to something else within your organization, and the costs for, for outsourcing to per, uh, professional service firms uh, can be covered uh, with most CARES funding. You know, there are some limits in there, but a lot of the, the funding has the, uh, you know, you, a certain administrative percentage that can be utilized and can be charged to those. So uh, something to be thinking about and to be understanding with this whole, uh, as it stands today, use it or lose it um, by, t by 1230, you know, what is the best way to, to provide these funds to um, my constituents? Uh, designating a champion, this is something that we do within our own uh, service teams, and I think that it's worked well, is give each person one area of compliance or guidance to, to master. Like, all right, uh, you know, uh, uh, employee A, we, you are going to be in charge of checking the Treasury website and seeing, you know, every day, do we have a, an updated um updated guidance and updated FAQs. And you're also gonna sign up to the mailing list from CARES and, and get that and summarize anything that the group needs to know. Uh, employee B, you're gonna be in charge of subrecipient monitoring. So all the money that we're passing through, you're gonna make sure that we have a risk assessment in place uh, for, that, for those funds and that we are in line with the four things related to uh, subrecipient monitoring. Uh, we're going to have another person in charge of reporting. Well, at our firm, we have someone that, that, that is in charge of reporting who's communicating with, with OIG and saying, hey, we don't know what bucket to put this in. Can you tell us? Can you help us out, figure this out? You're right. And, and it's a lot of building the plane as they fly, um, even at OIG and Treasury. So sometimes you get a good answer. Sometimes you say they, they answer, oh, look at the guidance and FAQs, which we all know of. But still, uh, kind of doing it that way, I think, has been helpful for us and may be helpful for you all. And again, training, you know, sign up for those, uh, the CPE and alerts from reliable sources. There is a large number of organizations that have COVID-19 response pages. You know, I'm talking about the, um, the National League of Cities, National Association of Counties, uh, you know, states have their own, um, their own organizations, Association of Governmental Accountants. And so if you sign up for the alerts for those pages, Hopefully things will catch your eye as as they um, as they pertain to you all. So that would be another recommendation as you're working through the last three months of the the, uh, the coronavirus really funding as it sits now. All right, we're gonna get into uh, compliance best practices next. Uh, looking at the chat, I don't see any questions yet. But again, I want to remind you all: if you have questions, just let me know and I will answer them. Um, as we work through this, this presentation. All right. So the first thing I want to touch on is in regards to this funding, what are you going to be evaluated uh, to and against? And you're going to be evaluated multiple ways. You're going to be, you may be selected for a, you know, an OIG or, or federal audit you know, where they're going to want to evaluate things. You may be getting this money um, from the state and the state is going to build things that they want to see based off of your, the, their perceived risk of passing that money through to you. You know, that would be, you know, the invoices, the, um, quarterly, the monthly reporting stuff that they need to then report up to, you know, to the OIG, those types of things. And then there's also the, the, the federal single audit. So this is when you expend more than 750 in, uh, federal awards and this this uh, coronavirus relief funding is subject to them. The provider relief funding is subject to it. The, the PPP loans are not, you know, that so most of the most of the CARES Act funding is, but you know, you want to be, you know, you 
you'll want to be checking and making sure that you know which is subject to single audit and which isn't. But when you get into a single audit, there's two things that we test and two things that we look for. And I'm actually gonna start on the right side. The first thing that we do is we look at your internal controls related to compliance. So your internal controls over compliance. So we want to make sure that they're in place to ensure that your compliance is met. So what we do he here is we, we check to see, are they designed to prevent and detect or correct instances of non-compliance timely? So something like this would be, we select a sample of 25 expenditures and you told us that the way that you know you spend it right is that you know, grant, man grant manager X looks at them in initials off on everyone. So we're going to look at all, select all 25 and we're gonna be looking for that initial because that to us tells us that someone was in charge of compliance was doing their job. Uh, in terms of matching, say that you have, you know, maybe FEMA funds that have a matching requirement and you, what, what are you doing within your organization to ensure matching? So we're gonna, you, you say, oh, we have our GL code set up to where anytime we charge to this fund, it automatically shifts 25% of the expenses to this other fund. So we're gonna ask to walk through and, okay, show us posting an expense there and show us what the journal entry does in the system and how it captures that 75, 25% match. So whatever you're doing, whatever you tell us as the external auditor you're doing to comply, we're gonna to want to see that, it, that that's actually happening. So that's one piece. The second piece is compliance. Did you actually, uh, at the end of the day, meet that objective of only spending it on allowable costs, of only us uh, utilizing it with uh, for eligible entities? Was the report that you submitted timely and accurate? So that's the, the on the right side is, what are you doing to make sure you do things right? And then the left side is, did you do things right? So those are the those are the two types of tests that we do uh, within a single audit. And what I'm going to do now is just touch on control objectives for items that we believe may be what you'll be tested against in the federal single audit for your coronavirus uh, relief fund money, if that is a program that is selected to audit. So you'll want to make sure that you pay attention here, perk up that, hey, if I have uh, this type of funding, I need to make sure that that I'm in line with these things. So I'm gonna to touch on a few things here. The first one, not a shock that we assume that this is gonna be tested, but allowable uh, activities allowed and unallowable and allowable costs. So this is, did you spend it on the right thing uh, according to the guidance and was were the costs that you uh, in, uh, incurred related to those costs reasonable, right? So that's what we're looking for whenever we're testing this. Some example of controls, you know, thinking back to that, uh, 2020 part, uh, compliance supplement part six, these would be uh, controls that you might find in there. The manager must sign off on an invoice to indicate approval of expenditure, or you know, there's training programs for grant staff. So everyone that's, that's handling and, and in the procurement process for this funds has been through you know, eight hours of training and, and we're all on the same page. So that, those are examples of controls that you might have in place. Some common issues and findings that we see and, and keep in mind, findings are going to be even more common in single audits this year because you have that uh, lack of familiarity and those, re those restraint resources that we, we touched on earlier in the presentation. So as you're thinking about, um, you know, I'm, I don't want to be one of those people that gets the finding, that gets that, those, um, the significant deficiency or the non-compliance. Mm -hmm. This is what you want to be trying to avoid. Uh, absence, uh, things that we find is absence of evidence of review and ap approval of payroll and non-payroll expenditures. So you're telling us that um, you reviewed and approved and in looking at, at um, the, and, and when we go through and look at it, we, we are not seeing evidence of that. So we have no idea to tell that you actually did that control. Um, keep in mind that oral representation that you performed review is not evidence. You know, we need to be able to see something that is uh, documented. Telling us that you did it is not enough. Uh, unreconciled CFA, so that's the schedule of expenditures of federal awards. So that's where you, you go through and you list everything that you spent. And so if you, you go through and you list all of your expense, all of your expenses, and we can't tie that to your accounting system, there's an issue there, right? Because we're, we're, we want to make sure that we're testing everything that you spend with federal money. And if we can't tie from your accounting system to this uh, schedule, you know, that, that gives, perks us up that, hey, you, you might not be uh, tracking these things all the way correctly. Eligibility is another one. 
So there, you know, for, with some programs, you know, you're, you have some required uh, determinations to be made. So, you know, some documentation and verification that the people that are participating in this program uh, were determined to be eligible. So here, you know, thinking about maybe a small business program, uh, we're going to give out money to small businesses, uh, you know, to help them with their business interruption. Okay, great. Well, how did you make sure that they were a small business? You know, did you, did you request a, a DUNS number? Did you, you know, Google search the, the website? Like, did you, what, what did you require financial statements from that, the business? What did you do to ensure that the people that you gave the money out to uh, were eligible? And you can assume that this is a, a hot button with the coronavirus relief fund money, right? Because it's, it'd be really easy for these uh, scammers to just send out, hey, yeah, I totally had business interruption. Send me a thousand dollars. They set up 20 fake uh, applications, you give them $20,000 and you didn't do the work as far as checking to make sure they were a real business. Uh, so you'll want to make sure that you have controls in place there. So de determine whatever those eligibility requirements are for your program, you should have that checklist prepared and reviewed of, oh, yes, I did verify all of these things related to that program. Uh, your program director is going to be reviewing the a report to make sure that the beneficiaries make sense. You know, say you have some type of individual beneficiary program. And so those are ways that you want that, those are the types of controls that we would be looking for. Uh, the common things that we find is there's no support, documented support to verify a beneficiary's eligibility. So if, if we go in and we're, we're auditing, we're saying, how did you know that this, you know, 300,000 you gave to small businesses made it to, to small businesses? You all built the eligibility criteria of this is all who, only the people we're gonna give it to. What did you do to make sure that that the money that went out the door went out the door to only eligible recipients? And so we want we need to see that documentation. Um, also, we're looking at an allocation of expense between multiple programs where beneficiary is only subject to one. So here you're thinking about say you set up a few different programs and you say, if you apply for this program and we give you the funding for this, you can apply for program B, C, and D. So what did you do to make sure that this person didn't receive funding for B, C, and D, right? Because you, you set out that this framework at the top that, hey, they're only eligible for one of these uh, programs. Next one is period of performance. You know, in the coronavirus relief fund money, you have a very set time period uh, that you can utilize as funds, right? You, know, March, you have March 1st to December 30th. Again, if you're not a direct recipient, maybe you have a, a short or shorter time frame that they've given you all to uh, expend these funds. So this is looking at that you only spent it within that uh, appropriate period of, of availability. So what we're looking there is most of the time, this is a, along the review of when you make sure that you spent it appropriately. They're also checking to see that you um, spent it in the right period, right? So was that good or, uh, or cost incurred uh, by December 30, uh, 2020? The guidance, the federal guidance is put, ha, treasury guidance has some caveats there as far as if you're running into supply chain issues, um, you know, what is considered incurred. They have a good couple paragraphs there as far as what you, is considered incurred as of 1231 uh, 2020 that you'll want to look at. Uh, in addition, another control example is that, you know, there's some type of approval. So every time maybe you're submitting the, your uh, report up to the state, you know, they're, they're, you're checking to make sure, okay, all of these expenses were within the good, the, that proper period, we feel fine. Uh, common issues is just a lack of uh, review of expenditures to make sure that everything is matching up. You know, you have a, a, a large number of, fund, of funding sources that you may be pulling from, and they each, unfortunately, you're probably gonna have different period of performance dates. So keeping those in line and knowing, okay, for this one, I can only charge from this state to this state. For this one, I, could, I have a little bit more time. I have into the net, middle of next year. Um, you know, so we're looking at those different period performances for the different uh, types of funding. And then also the next one, you know, if you're drawing down money after without, without a waiver or, or, or approval. So some, in some instances, not this uh, coronavirus relief fund money, but in some instances like construction contracts, you have till the end of the year to spend it, but they, but then stuff happens. You get with the federal agency and they say, yeah, go ahead. You can spend it for addition, an additional six months. So you need to make sure you have that documentation before you start drawing money after um, that original period of uh, performance. Two more. 
that we're going to go on go into as far as uh, compliance. The next one is reporting. Uh, and keep in mind, these are ones that we believe are going would be tested if you all have this as a major program uh, subject to audit. Uh, so here you're ha you have a, um, you know, the reporting that you have to do to OIG quarterly if you're a direct recipient, uh, sorry, or, you know, or a prime recipient, or if you're receiving the money through the state or cities and counties that got it directly, you're having to report to them. So those are the reports that we're talking about. In addition, some uh, states, cities and counties are requiring performance reports. Hey, we're going to give you this money, but we want you to report to us monthly how it's going. You know, and that's again based off of risk. They determine risk, or even, you know, maybe their their uh, city council is just interested in in how things are going. They want to be able to report back to their uh, constituents, so they may ask for some performance type measures in there as well. So what we do uh, here is we make sure two things: one, did you submit it on time, and two, did you uh, have all of the backup necessary to support whatever you submitted? So that's really the two prong test there. So as far as some type of controls you can have in place, of course, that manager signing off, reviewing the report, uh, tracking system, are you setting, have you set up Outlook reminders or do you have some type of calendar uh, alert that tells you, well, hey, this one is due on this date. You know, that, that's a good sign of a, of a control in place. The GL detail being attached. So before we submit it, we attach all of the detail. It tie, we've showed that it ties from one report to the other. Uh, you can also set up automated controls if there's a certain performance report that uh, an entity wants that's pretty easily automated. That's another um, that's another way that you can have a control in place as far as okay, it's just going to pull these three numbers because that's where we get the information from. Issues that we find again, uh, oral representation again that you perform the review is not enough. Oh yeah, by me submitting it, that means I reviewed it. Well, how? how how do we how do we know that that's the case? Is there an email that you sent that said yes, I I approved it? What are, what can we see to show that you have reviewed this report? Uh, failure to submit until after the fact, you know. So you know sometimes if it's a day or two late, you know maybe it's not that big of a deal. But if you haven't submitted the things things you know a couple of weeks late, especially if you're receiving the money as a pass through, that can cause a lot of problems uh, for those prime recipients and also unreconciled or incomplete supporting documentation. Hey, you sent me this report that you spent a hundred thousand, but the detail says that you spent eighty-two. What, what, what's the other eighteen for? Why are you asking for this? And so, be kind of closing the loop as far as reporting. And lastly, uh, the last one I'm going to touch on here, and this could be a whole new hour, two-hour class, is uh, you know subrecipient monitoring. So the way that the federal guidance is written is if you receive the fu federal funding and you pass it through to another entity to administer the program, you all are on the hook for how they utilize that funding. And the way that they're expecting you all to ensure compliance is by doing this uh, subrecipient monitoring. So there's a few things that you all have to do in terms of uh, monitoring. And again, this could be an entire class but really I break it up into to four areas and let's see if I can uh, repeat them all off. First, the contract has to have a ver very specific information. So when you're passing through money, you should have a standard template contract with, I think it's a list of about 17 things that you need to be telling the person that you're passing the money through to. So if you don't have the template to that, that is something you, know, you wanna maybe reach out to a, a professional services firm for, or you know, even Google, uh, this 20.200.330, and it gives you examples of the things that you need for the contract. Second one is a, the risk assessment. So did you, have, before passing this money through to an entity, did you look to see what the risk was, was give, with giving them this money? Are they good at um, utilizing grant funds? Do they have a good structure in place? Or are they, is this new to them? And it's fine that you give them the money, but I might, you might need to do a little bit more to make sure that they comply. Um, the third one is, ensuring that they uh, received their, uh, if, if they were needed to get an audit, that they, uh, you know, evaluating the findings related to the audit and seeing if there's any findings related to your program. And then also, you know, what is their response as far as uh, improving uh, going forward? And the, uh, oh, the fourth one is the actual 
monitoring itself. So are you doing a desk review? Are you requiring them to submit something to you all monthly? How are you doing that evaluation on, uh, on that ongoing basis based off of their risks? So, is it, so the examples of control uh, is this is that monitoring review, uh, making sure that your agreements and contracts have the required information. This is where we see a lot of areas just in general. And um, with this funding, with people being subrecipients for the first time, I would uh, make a wager that this is going to be the area that has the, the, most, the most amount of findings uh, with, the, with this funding. So uh, control findings is not performing that risk assessment, just not even knowing I needed to evaluate them before I pass the money through. Uh, not monitoring them as it goes through, you know, kind of just thinking I gave them the money, they should make sure that they have everything in line, you know, and not doing your, your job as, a, as the entity passing it through uh, to make sure that, that they're utilizing it appropriately. There is a definition of a subcontractor and a definition, so, uh, sorry, of a subrecipient and definition of a, a contractor or vendor uh, within this guidance. And you really want to be looking at that to see, do, are they a subrecipient or are they a a, a contractor or, or vendor. And it is a, a subjective determination, but that's another thing that you're gonna to wanna to be documenting. My favorite way to teach um, how to make sure that you all have controls in place is this idea of leading the horse to water. Uh, I put this in a lot of my grants, uh, internal control for compliance presentations, because I think, you know, this is, it's a really good visual approach of how to, to deal with this. And so this is what we wanna do. Right, the, the auditor is the horse and we want to have this, we want to lead them to the water or the auditable controls. We want, we want to be able to, hey auditor, here, look, this is how we know what we need to comply with. This is how, these are the controls that we have and this is what you should be auditing. And so the way that you can do that, there's this Excel template uh, that we've put together and you know, reach out to me uh, after and I'd be happy to provide uh, information related to this, but it's pretty simple. First, you're going to come up with what is subject to audit. So for this funding, these are the things that are subject to audit. So I, these, here's this is the list of all of the compliance requirements that may be subject to audit. I kind of shared with you all what we think it's going to be for the coronavirus relief fund money. And so we have a subject to audit, and this is the person that is responsible. So delegating and designating, this is the person that is going to have to uh, ensure that we're complying, that we have the controls and we have compliance in place. Next, based, you take the ones that are subject to audit. So let me go back. You can see we've highlighted the ones that we've determined that are subject to audit here in the middle. And then from those, how are we complying? What is the control that we control and process that we have in place? So you, you write out a narrative there. This is what we at X County and uh, of uh, Kansas are doing to comply. And then the next one is the key control. This is the one thing or the two things that are very important and that we're doing. So you, you write out a process in that second bullet, second box, you identify the very specific key controls in the third. And then what is the documentary evidence? What are you going to give to the auditors when they come so that they can see it? Invoice with manager signature, for example. And then right before you're gonna get into the audit, you wanna do this pre-audit verification. So do a little sampling of yourself and just pick five expenditures, pick five uh, small business applications and just check. Did we do column two, three, and four? And do we have that evidence when the auditor uh, comes through? This is something that we like to do um, you know, at, at BKD as one of our uh, you know, pre-audit services, uh, you know, preparing you all uh, for the single audit. Just, we kind of talk you through this process and, and we try to look for gaps. You know, where are you not, uh, you know, where in these areas that we've all agreed are important to audit. Are you not, do you not have a strong process in place? Can you not tell me that there's a control that I can go look to? Uh, and we make sure that we build that out that way whenever your audit comes around, whether it be the single audit, the, you know, the federal compliance audit uh, from the OIG um, or from this, this, the state if, or counties that are passing through the money, you, you know, you fly pass the flying colors and you don't have that uh, negative exposure uh, and risk that you that would go along there. So, all right, great. I'm checking again. I do not see questions now. Um, I'll go ahead and do. Let me type in something real quick. 
I'm pretty active on, um, on LinkedIn and sharing resources and we're going to get to resources here at the end, but I'll go ahead and share. That's my LinkedIn page. Please feel free to uh, connect, connect with me. I'll, I'll also go ahead and share um, the BKD COVID response page there in the summary as well. A couple of resources that you all will, will have. I'll pull up the BKD one here uh, in a little bit. So I was also asked to touch on accounting issues. So let's get away from compliance and let's touch a little bit on uh, the debits and credits related to this, this funds. Um, I'm gonna ask you all for a favor in the chat. I apologize that I don't know. What is the most common year end for uh, Kansas uh, state and local governments? If someone can type that in in the chat for me. Or, or if there's various. Perfect. Calendar year. Lucky you all. 630's got it worse. Well, probably, yeah, probably 630's got it worse. 930's got it even worse than that. You all are uh, having it a little bit easier as far as determining what's within each year. So there's two, two, two things that GASB put out that I want to share with you all to make sure you all know. Um, the other thing in, that, I, that I do is I'm, I'm on the uh, AICPA's Technical Issues Committee. And so we meet with GASB and we, you know, we talk to them about the issues that you all are, are facing before they become standards. And you know, one of the things that we told them is they're really, really, really appreciative of how they've handled the pandemic you know, with pushing back the standards a year, pushing back leases 18 months. Um, and they have also put together an emergency toolbox and a technical bulletin. So if you all don't know this, it's, it's very prominent on the GASB website, uh, the information that we have. So here you can see the emergency tool, toolkit, it's a list of things that um, you may have not dealt with in a while as you normally go through your, your, the course of your accounting, but that they're picking their head up now because of COVID. Some examples, subsequent event disclosure. What actually is a recognized subsequent event versus a unrecognized subsequent event? Capital asset impairment, uh, donated PPE, um, revenue and expense recognition. When, what, when do I recognize revenue related to this grant funding? So there's a list of 21 things that you may not have dealt with in a while. And what it does, you can look here down here at the bottom, it gives you the issue, how that might be relevant to COVID and then the section of the guidance where you can get that information. So they're saying we've already, there is gap accounting out there, but this is where you would need to go. So you could, that's a very helpful resource with all of my 630s and 930s, uh, 930 audits, we've had to turn to it at least once to make sure that we're getting the accounting right for a, a certain thing. Also on that website, I told you all a lot of places have uh, really strong uh, COVID websites. So there it provides a list of 21 organizations offering advice. So that has the GFOA, National League of Cities, all those things. So if you just Google uh, GASB Emergency Toolkit or Toolbox, you will find um, that information. As you go through your clothes or you're struggling with how to account for things, a very, very helpful resource. Some of the questions that it may answer, uh, I touched on that one. We received a large amount of donated PPE, which is funny that now we call PPE uh, personal protective equipment. You know, we're used to it being, uh, you know, property planning equipment, but you receive P uh, personal protective equipment. How do I account for that? Hey, we made a one-time extension on the property tax due date. What are the accounting implications of this? Um, we're uncertain about the collectability of receivables. I can tell you I have some entities that have never uh, had to worry about a certain type of uh, receivable that now they're like, oh, I, how do I come up with an allowance? Uh, and a lot has happened since year. And what do I need to put in my MDNA and subsequent event footnotes, right? Your, your MDNA kind of, if mo for most of us, we carry it over year to year, not much changes. But when you're looking at economic impact and next year's factors and, and, and debt and, and capital asset, uh, information. What does the guidance actually say about what needs to be in there? Because it might need to be putting something that I haven't put uh, in the past. So if you're running into those scenarios, you're not alone. And that's why they put that resource out there. The second thing that they've put together is the uh, a technical bulletin. So this is the first time that Gatsby put together a technical bulletin since 2008. So you can tell uh, they needed to get some guidance out there. This is how they how they did it. They understood the the there was a need for the for accounting. So there's six question and answers. And again, Google Gatsby Technical Bulletin number 20-1. Uh, the first one is, 
these coronavirus relief funds, are they subject to eligibility or purpose requirements? Uh, what could, because that'll change when you uh, recognize revenue. And so it goes in and it says it's eligibility requirements and you'd recognize the revenue when the eligibility requirements have been met. And one of those main eligibility requirements is the incurrence of eligible expenditures. For you all as a calendar you're in, should not be as difficult with uh, your coronavirus relief fund money, but maybe with FEMA funding, funding or provider relief funding, something that may extend beyond the county or end, you know, you, this is what you want to be thinking about as far as purpose versus eligibility requirements. The second one, um, for the provider relief funding, there's, you can, you're allowed to charge loss of revenue. And so it was saying, how do I recognize revenue for, for loss of revenue? How do I determine when that eligibility requirement uh, is met? And so there they go into giving you ideas as far as when you're taking that action, um, that's when you'd recognize loss, loss of revenue. Since this bulletin came out, the uh, uh, Department of Health and Human Services has actually put out a, a, a kind of a calculation as far as how you would come up with loss of revenue that's a little bit more stringent uh, than we were thinking, um, but they, they talked through how to think about that. Third one, if amendments to the CARES Act are enacted after your end, but prior to the issuance of the financial statements, should effective amendments be recognized in the financials? And they say that no, those amendments would be considered a non-recognized subsequent event. So this was saying, say uh, you have a, a 930 year end and today they go through and amend the CARES Act for some, something that of impacts um, recognition and measurement. They completely change the, the legislation. Do I recognize that in my 930 financials or not? And this is saying, no, you do not. The one caveat there is these FAQs that are being updated, this treasury guidance that's being updated, what we're being told is that is just additional information to matters that already existed. So those would be recognized subsequent events um, so really that is the burden and, it, and it's in that technical bulletin is, is this, a, is this new legislation or is this just more facts and more knowledge about stuff that had already been in place in year end? And that's kind of how you make that determination as far as it's recognized or unrecognized. Uh, but you'll definitely want to get to your, um, with your auditor or, uh, you know, whatever CPA from you use to, to, to talk through that. PPP loans, they say what, you know, they're talking about when, do, does the liability come off of your books? And they say, keep the liability on your books until you've been legally released uh, from the debt. The next one, this, is, this matters a lot more for, for special purpose governments. They, you know, if, hey, we've received this type of funding. Do I report it as operating or, or non-operating revenues? And they say, except for certain uh, portions of the provider relief fund guidance, this funding should be reported as a subsidy. And it, big implications, right? Because it's a subsidy, it goes into no, to non-operating, your expenses are in operating. So for those of those governments that have debt covenants that rely on some type of operating uh, revenue uh, ratio, you're putting all of this, all of this funding in non-operating and you're having to go back and talk to um, you know, your, your banks and tell them like, look, I do have the money. It's just in a different spot than normal. And that is definitely challenging, especially for special purpose governments. I will tell you all that casinos in, in particular uh, are dealing with this pretty heavily right now because they, you know, they were closed and they get, they're getting funding, but you know, they're having to put it in and non-operating. So not, so this is an issue, an issue with the debt co uh, covenant compliance. The airline industry is another one. You know, they're having to put all of this money in, in uh, non-operating as well. So things to be thinking about there. Um, they ask, is the, is the outflows related to this a extraordinary or special item? And, you know, the Gatsby went through and said, no, that they said the, the event is a appearance of a coronavirus disease. And they're saying that it was not infrequent. And so therefore it's not an extraordinary item. Also, they're saying it's not within the control of management. So it's not a special item. One can argue uh, either way on this one. I think I fell on the other side when in talking with Gatsby as far as I thought of the, the stay at home order and in the closing of the country was something that was extraordinary and never happened before. They landed on the side of the, the actual underlying event was the disease, which is not uh, infrequent. So uh, you can't use uh, record your outflows as extraordinary special items. 
So anyway, just you know, really quickly wanted to touch on some of the accounting, uh, and I'm going to go ahead and conclude. Um, yes, and thank you, Paula, for sharing that. You know, if, if I don't get to any questions for you all here today, and I'll stay on as long as you all need me to stay on, unless there's a, a presentation after. But you know, please put them in the chat. Um, I'll provide my email address as well. You can, and you already have my my link in there. But here are some resources. Uh, we have the Treasury Coronavirus Relief Fund guidance and the FAQs, Kansas Spark website, Pro Provider Relief Fund FAQs. Get on those agency mailing lists if you're not. A, a little bit of an odd one: political reporters. There's a few that I follow on Twitter. I listed these two out. And you can, you know, there, we're in the last days of the talks of are we going to get another relief fund before the election? And as of this morning, after before I presented this, it looked like no. Um, but in that was about a quarter of a trillion for state and local governments if it went through. So, you know, kind of following along with them, great people to follow to see, you know, what's going on with legislation that could impact your funding. CNBC is a good resource. A couple of people there that provide information. And of course, the BKD COVID-19 um, resources center. So just to show you all to make sure that you know where I'm going, where you're going uh, for each of these. This is the, the uh, coronavirus relief fund website. So you just type in coronavirus relief fund guidance. This is what it looks like. And it goes through um, you know, the ex what, what expenditures you can incur, what you can incur. Gives examples, not in, uh, all inclusive, but it gives exam examples of what is allowable. Hopefully you all are already aware of that. But between this and the FAQ that has uh, you know, 56 question and answers as far as what are eligible expenditures. These are your two documents to go to outside of any state things to know every 90% of what there is to know as far as what is allowable. Um, this is the reporting if you're a prime recipient or if you're curious as a, as a subrecipient, this uh, treasury guidance reporting is a very good one. Uh, this is the HHS. Uh, provider relief fund uh, frequently asked questions. So it goes through questions as far as what do I need to be doing with this funding? What is eligible expenses? Uh, here is the, the Kansas resources and guides. I'm sure you're aware of that Spark County resources if you're, um, if you're dealing with it for as, a, as a county. And then yeah, here's Politico just to give you an example. This was yesterday, House delays vote on COVID relief. That was, they were gonna say, they were gonna pass this uh, like a, basically a ceremonial bill last night to, to, so the House could say that they passed something. They held off because they're hoping to get a deal done today. Uh, before, as of before this presentation, there it didn't look like they were going to. Um, but again, another another resource for you all. Here's the BKD COVID-19 Resource Center. If you just Google BKD COVID-19 Resource, you'll get you to this page. You'll want to go to the public sector section, uh, and this you can see. Here are four things. Um, that we, the, the four most recent things that we put out as far as resources for uh, compliance to make sure that you're, you know, doing uh, what you need to be doing with this funding. You know, we're right at uh, the 1115 mark. So to be, um, you know, respectful of your time, I'll, we will go ahead and, um, and con conclude here. There are my, is my email and my LinkedIn page. Please feel free to uh, reach out. I'm putting it in the chat as well. Um, thank you guys very much for, for your time. And I'll go ahead and turn it back over to, to Paula. And you know, please share in the chat or, or hop on if you have any questions. Danny, thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions last minute? Make sure that you get it into the chat and we'll make sure that Danny responds to that or you can reach out to him directly. He's been very gracious to provide his LinkedIn uh, account and his email address. So if you have any direct questions, I'm sure he'll be happy to work with you. We will make sure that at the end of this session, uh, sometime in maybe tomorrow or early Monday morning, you will receive additional information and the PowerPoint presentations, et cetera, and any other resources that were mentioned. We appreciate you taking this new adventure to do a virtual conference with K Kansas GFOA. Um, and we are grateful for all of our sponsors, including BKD, that were willing to continue to support us during this time and also provide presentations uh, during the conference. Each week, uh, you will receive uh, link information about sessions that are upcoming. So we hope that you'll be able to join us next week. Uh, we'll have sessions both on Thursday and Friday for short periods of time. Um, and if you have anything or need anything, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. 
Uh, Ted, do you have anything that you want to say before we log off? I just want to thank Danny and BKD. This was excellent. Lots of great information, and I really appreciate it. Um, and thank you to everybody for attending. We will see you next week. Uh, thank you all very much.